Hello everybody and welcome to a game that I think is called Kyomet, although I'm not entirely sure of the pronunciation here. This is going to be a very rambly, not very well thought out video because I'm just making this on a random Saturday. Um, I don't really have any big plans to return to making regular YouTube content. So much has changed since I was last doing that. Um, I moved to a different city, and I got married. Um, the pandemic hit, all sorts of things, and at, at least at the moment, my situation is not really super conducive to making regular YouTube content. Um, but I wanted to make a short sort of one-off video on this game um, because I started playing it uh, last weekend and it's pretty addictive. And a lot of people on the server were asking me for advice, guides, strategy, an idea of what the empire that I've built looks like because uh, this is a game with Fog of War. Uh, and so I wanted to make just a quick video essentially for them, and I'm sorry to my <laughs> people who have been subscribed to me for a long time. Uh, no Oxygen Not Included content today, um, but maybe in the future. I definitely want to play the, the DLCs that have come out. So anyways, Kyomet. Uh, this is a simple sort of IO web-based game. Uh, you can go to kyomet.com and play it. And uh, the basic idea is you capture towers, those towers generate units and various effects, and then you can use that to try and expand. And right now, I am by far the largest player on the server. Uh, it isn't even close. I can basically go to sleep at night or be EF AFK for pretty much the entire day. And I'm so big that even if people are trying to, to kill me, uh, there's not a whole lot they can do about it. I'm at the stage where the sort of the anti-big mechanics, like the zombies, which get stronger as you get bigger, are using nuclear weapons. That those That's what those little uh, white circles are, nuclear weapons going off, being launched by zombies. So I don't think what I did here in creating this empire was necessarily all that difficult, and I think it can be replicated by pretty much anyone else. Uh, and so I want to go over today what uh, you would need to do to have this level of success, if you want to call it that, and I'll get into why maybe this isn't a great success in the future. Because I guess Kyomet's the sort of game where it can continue on infinitely if you like, um, but you really have to set some goals for yourself, and making an empire like this might not necessarily be uh, the goal that you want to set for yourself. So anyways, let me first discuss the basics, because most of the people that I see in this game don't understand the basics. They basically have not read any of the instructions or help stuff. Uh, so let me zoom in here and just pick a building at random. These are all the buildings and units that you can create. Um, from barracks to cities to towns, projectors, all this stuff. Um, it's not a very large selection. Not all these are even all that relevant. Um, villages, towns, uh, cities, they're basically just for generating points. Mainly, if you want to use them in an actual way, you turn them into a headquarters, which is just essentially a defensive building. But I'll get each building in a second. But like the point is, there isn't a whole lot to learn here, and the it, you can, it'll show you exactly what the building does. Uh, and there's really only a couple sort of unspoken things that you need to understand about these buildings um, to really understand a lot about the game. So first off, I'm just going to go through all these buildings because I. And honestly, watching a lot of people play, I think they haven't actually looked at what these things do. Um, and I'll discuss sort of the pros and cons of each of them. So first off, we have the barracks. This is one that most players are familiar with. It generates little infantry units, uh, one every six seconds. And these infantry units, we can go to the units tab if we want to highlight these guys, are basically worth uh, one point in combat. Um, and that's sort of the way that this calculates combat. Uh, it'll have these units trade for each other in some ratio. Um, this one is just the basic, this is what's worth one. And it produces one of these units uh, once every six seconds. You can upgrade this building to an armory. Uh, there are certain requirements that you have to have somewhere in your empire to support um, an armory, uh, but this typically isn't that hard to achieve. Uh, in the very beginning, you might have some problems having the right mix of things, but later on, you're not going to have any issues having as many of these requirements as you want. Um, the armory, and I'll sometimes confuse this with a factory because I'm used to playing StarCraft, <laughs> um, produces tanks once every 15 seconds, and the tanks deal 3 damage. So even though the tanks move slower than the infantry, 
Um, they, pound for pound, are going to get more combat out of the armory than, than you get out of the infantry from the barracks. Um, so upgrading to an armory is usually a good idea. I'll get into one instance, really, where it isn't, um, unless you care about the speed. But for the most part, armory is a pretty good idea. I like upgrading all of my barracks to armories, with an exception that I'll get into once I've kind of gone through all the buildings. Next we have cliffs. Cliffs are a pretty strong defensive structure. Um, naturally they can contain 30 uh, shield points. That's what these are. Um, and buildings by default, there are a couple exceptions, will generate um, a shield every five seconds. So they'll slowly recharge their shields over time. Um, cliffs, just being able to absorb 30 of something is a pretty big deal, right? Because uh, 30 of something, as you might recall, is basically either 30 of these infantry, which is going to take you a pretty long time to accumulate, or it's going to be uh, 10 of these tanks, which is still gonna be you know two and a half minutes. So even just plowing through a cliff, just one of these sort of natural defenses is going to be a little bit tricky. And it gets even stronger when you go to a rampart. You can upgrade a cliff to a rampart. It's kind of, a, this is the, one of the bigger decisions you have to make in terms of which buildings you go with. Um, because the Rampart is one of the better defensive structures in the game. It not only has 45 shield capacity, but it generates its shield almost twice as fast as anything else. This is one of the, the few buildings in the game that uh, has this superior shield generation rate. And uh, you'll often end up using this on your front line. You won't want to kind of build out into the other things. Um, but it comes at a big cost because the other thing that you can build a cliff into is a quarry. The quarry gives you two points uh, for score. I'm at 17,000 points right now, and I don't really care to build any of my stuff into quarries, so I don't think it's super important that you maximize the points that your buildings are giving you. Um, but you can if you like, and if I went through, I could probably uh, increase the points of my empire by quite a bit. But the most important part of the quarry is that it can get you to the nuclear silo. Um, and a nuke does essentially infinite damage, although there are a few caveats to that, um, and it'll generate one of these nukes every two minutes. And the nice thing about nukes is you can generate, uh, you can have a nuke generated, and then if you wait another two minutes, a second one will basically be ready to go. So you'll launch the first, and then soon after the second one will appear. So they kind of, they, they, they load up in a way where you can get two of them in the silo, um, more or less. Um, it'll take it'll take just a little while for the the nuke to to the second nuke to appear, but you can um, sort of front load your your nukes that way, and the nukes will destroy nearly every single building and all the units in that uh, that, that that node uh, instantly. Um, it'll of course have to travel there, um, but that's you know a small price to pay, and uh, there are. I guess three exceptions to this, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, or to get to the third one in a second. The first, of course, is the bunker. It only takes 10 damage from a nuclear weapon, and the units on uh, the, the point will be protected, essentially, as long as the bunker has hit points. Um, and then there is the headquarters, which only takes 20 damage from a nuke. And both of these are pretty beefy structures. Uh, they have 40 uh, shield points each, so it's going to take a few nukes to really bring these things down. They're not impervious to them, but they are resistant to them, and more importantly, they protect troops that are on them. The third exception, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, is that you can simply shoot down nukes. If the nuke crosses a path of any unit, uh, a fired gun from a fired shell from an artillery, uh, a, a fired missile from a launcher, another nuke, uh, another unit, just a, a random infantry unit um, traveling in the exact same direction as the nuke, but in the opposite direction, I guess. So if, if if you fire this nuclear silo at a, a barracks that's right next to it and connected to it, and they send out one soldier from that barracks to go meet the nuke, the nuke will detonate on that soldier and not destroy the barracks. Um, so this is something important to note because it creates a lot of the sort of rock, paper, scissors that we're going to see for these sort of launched projectiles. Um, very powerful. A lot of players seem to know about these, but they don't know that you can shoot down nukes. Um, by aiming something. If you have a building that shoots a projectile, you can aim at the thing that's trying to nuke you and shoot down the nuke. And if you are fortunate enough that it's a unit producing building that it's aiming at and there's a direct connection between that unit producing building and the nuke, then you can run a unit into the nuke and, and kill it that way. 
Um, but this is an important feature that a lot of people kind of get confused at. They launch a nuke at something and then the other person counters it and they don't realize why the building didn't get destroyed. Next up we have the factory, which doesn't really do much. Uh, it's worth two points, so if you keep it in this unupgraded state, that's where you get the most points, but I don't really care about that. Um, the centrifuge is mainly what I upgrade it to because I want to get to the projector. The projector essentially sends shields to other buildings. Um, it generates faster uh, faster shields than, than other buildings, like the rampart. Um, but the fact that it is generating a point of shield every three seconds, and the fact also that it will emit shields if it receives a shield, is going to become very important later on because for the very high advanced play, uh, this building is going to become very important. I'll get back to that uh, once I've covered the other buildings. Refineries also exist. Uh, I don't really build these that much. I This is just a, a building that you build as a requirement for other things. I typically don't have problems having my, those requirements met, so it's not that big of a deal. Similarly, the generator and the reactor, you only build them as requirements. They're, these are basically the most useless buildings in the game. And there's really, I don't even bother upgrading them because the defensive stats in terms of how much shield it generates uh, or and can contain are pretty much the same. The troops that it can contain are the same as well. So this is this is basically uh, the generator slash reactor are non-issues. These, these are tiles that, that are basically don't have a building on them. Finally, you have the mine. Or not the finally. What am I talking about? We're only halfway through. Um, the mine is worth two points, like the fact, or like the the factory. It's worth two points unupgraded. So if you care about maximizing your points, which I don't really care about, um, you can keep it in its unupgraded state. Very commonly, you'll upgrade it to the bunker. This is one of the best defensive buildings. Um, it has the best resistance against nukes and artillery. Um, and also, there's pretty much no reason not to upgrade it to the bunker besides the the points because this is the necessary step to produ uh, producing an artillery piece. Uh, and artillery are actually pretty good. Um, you do need two of them attacking something to bring that thing down, because otherwise uh, this artillery shell will deal three damage um, and you'll produce one of them every 15 seconds. So you won't, you, you'll basically only be keeping pace with the shield generation of a standard building. Um, you'll need two of these aiming at something in order to bring that building down. Um, but that's fine because you're typically not, if this is the backline thing, if you don't have this on the front line where combat is taking place, um, you can make as many of these things out of your bunkers as you like. And you usually have time if you kind of want to change things to shift them back to bunkers. Like if it looks like the war is going a little bit badly, you can shift them back to this defensive structure. It is worth noting they actually are kind of beefy themselves. They have 20 uh, hit points. Still not as good as the bunker, which is 40 and has all these damage resistances, but um, still pretty strong. Finally, they're not finally. Why do I keep saying finally? Uh, there's the radar, which upgrades either down into the launcher or into a satellite. Um, satellites are incredibly useful. I don't want to discount these. Having a 150% higher visual range gives you a lot of ability to see into your opponent and either see if they're going to attack you or if you're attacking them, what you can aim at. Um, it's pretty important in projectile wars to have um, vision of what's going on, but they don't really multiply very well, right? Like if you have a satellite in a decent location, you don't need another satellite in a slightly worse location. You won't see anything extra. And so you might as well turn those into launchers. Uh, launchers have longer range than pretty much all the other projectiles. They only deal one point of damage and they only generate a missile once every 80 seconds, but that missile will disable the building that it hits for 60 seconds. So in theory, two launchers can permafreeze a building. Uh, and this is can be pretty important if your opponent is using that building as a rally point because then units won't rally out of that building. You can stop their entire army, essentially. And it's a really sneaky way in battles to um, to prevent your opponent's army from, from moving forward and just having it instead uh, sit in a, a trit at whatever building it's at. Next we have the runway, which is sort of the, the if, this is, if the barracks is the ground forces thing, this is the air forces thing thematically. Um, in effect, though, there's not... Uh, a big difference. 
This produces a fighter every 30 seconds. You can upgrade it to produce a bomber every 30 seconds or uh, upgrade it again to produce a helicopter every 30 seconds. Um, this is the one time I'll go into the unit stab here. So the fighter deals three damage, moves at a fast speed, pretty solid, right? Um, so by default, essentially, your airstrip is going to be worth a little bit less than an armory in terms of raw um, combat power because the, the armory will be producing a tank, which deals three damage um, once every 15 seconds. You can upgrade to uh, a runway, I think it's called. I'm already forgetting which one is the airstrip and which one is the runway. I think runway is the one that gets a bomber. And it will deal five damage against surface units and one damage against air. So the, the bomber essentially gets countered by fighters and helicopters. Um, but otherwise brings up the combat potential of the building to roughly the same level as an armory. And then we have the helicopter, which is effectively the same as the fighter, but it has this weird ability that it can carry other units and have them travel at a fast speed. I don't really take advantage of this uh, in a big way. It, it's pretty rare for me to be so meticulous about how I set up my supply chains that I have... Um, a, a, uh, a chopper picking up tanks to make them move faster. But if you are very meticulous about this sort of thing, and this might be one of the goals that you kind of set for yourself in Kiyomet, um, this is a pretty interesting ability um, because it can bring a lot of power to bear really quickly, and, uh, and that's pretty interesting. So you kind of have these three options. Because the helipad is essentially strictly superior to the runway, there's some finagling there in terms of whether or not you want to store units at a location. The fighter, more fighters can be stored just by default at a runway, um, and more fighters can be stored at a variety of other buildings. Um, so in terms of just having a stored army, this is slightly better. But because you're going to be rallying out all your units pretty much anyways, that isn't really a big deal. Um, because there's, the helipad is almost strictly superior, typically what I'll do is I'll, I'll upgrade all of my, um, my runways into airfields. And then if I want some, uh, if I want to basically switch back to a different air unit, I will switch back. I will just upgrade again to the helipad um, because uh, I, I, if I'm going to have air units, I might as well have helicopters, I feel. like. Sometimes you do get them to move faster, and when it happens, it's actually a pretty neat, especially when you're trying to scout out an area, deliver a lot of troops fast into some newly freed up territory. Um, you can get a, a big bonus there. It's pretty rare when it happens, but I, I feel like there's basically no cost to doing it, so that's my, my upgrade strategy with that. Um, then we have the villages. I upgrade pretty much all the villages into headquarters. Sometimes if I'm trying to squeeze out a few more points just to kind of uh, reach a milestone for the night, I might upgrade down into cities. Cities are worth five points apiece, uh, whereas a headquarters is only worth one point. Um, but, I don't know, the, the headquarters has great defensive stats. A city or a town or any of this stuff basically doesn't. Um, so, on the front line where combat matters, and basically the part of the game that actually matters, um, you want to turn all of your towns into headquarters and just make them really difficult for people to, um, to try and plow through. It also contains a decent number of units, uh, eight infantry, two tanks. This might be the highest, I think, of all the buildings. Uh, it's not typically a relevant stat, how much sort of static, how, how many units you can contain in a building, um, but to the extent it's relevant, the headquarters is the one that really um, ha takes the cake. So. That's all of the buildings, and you have the understanding that um, you have these different uh, uh, projectiles that you can send, nukes, artillery, launchers, and there's sort of a, a little bit of a rock, paper, scissor game going on, in a sense, a light rock, paper, scissor game, where artillery are really good against nuclear silos. Uh, if you see your opponent with a nuclear silo, um, and they're doing a good job of, at countering your nuclear silos by nuking the nuke that you use to try and nuclear nuclear silo, um, you can put your artillery on their nuclear silo and over time you'll defeat that nuclear silo, right? Uh, and if they try and nuke the artillery that's taking down the silo, the artillery itself will defeat um, the, the, the nuke as it's in the air. Um, I've seen people try and do that. They see me gunning down their nuclear silo slowly um, and it's kind of a long upgrade process. Like if, if, they, if they get knocked back down to a cliff, 
um, when they try and upgrade back into this, they, they won't be able to keep their, their nuclear silo going. Um, so having artillery on the nuclear silo is a good counter, and the only real counter to that is just to have your projector um, supporting the nuclear silo and keeping its uh, shields up. Uh, so I like to set up my nuclear silos like that with the projector kind of backing them up, and then I use a lot of artillery on the front lines to attack enemy nuclear silos if they don't just let me nuke them right off the bat. One moment. Okay, I'm back. I said that this video was going to be long and rambly. Uh, anyways, um, so artillery are a good counter to silos. But then also you have these launchers which are a decent counter to artillery because they outrange the artillery. The range of a launcher is a lot higher. Um, and launchers are, are just pretty good all around things. You can use them to hit artillery, you can use them to hit nukes, you can use them to hit other launchers, you can use them to hit production buildings. Um, disabling a building for 60 seconds is actually a, a pretty good deal. I mean, essentially a launcher um, will tie up 75% of a building um, because it, it's launching every 80 seconds and freezing that building for 60 seconds. So don't sleep on these launchers. They're actually sneaky powerful. Um, use them against enemy uh, production buildings. Use them against shield generators. Use them against other projectiles. Um, they're just a really good all-around thing, and because of their range, are a good way to either stop nuclear silos or artillery. Um, and the nuclear silos are usually what you use to try and counter everything else. Um, if you can get in range, you can nuke essentially all of their stuff. Nuke their, um, their unit production, nuke their nuclear silos if they're not paying attention, nuke their vision. Uh, nuking artillery and launchers is a little bit tricky because if your opponent sees that's what you're doing, then they'll be able to shoot your nuke out of the sky. Um, but a lot of people don't even know about that mechanic, so you can get away with it a lot of the time. Now here's the really tricky thing. This is the thing that is probably the most advanced level play in the entire game. And it is that uh, the rate at which units will, um, or, or the frequency with which units will determine whether or not they should leave a building is based on the building's um, generation rate. Right, so a barracks here, for example, is going to generate a troop every six seconds, which means if uh, this building has 12 infantry on it and it generates another infantry, it's going to tell all the army units, planes, tanks, helicopters, everything, it's gonna tell it all to go to its next rally point, which means if you're setting up these sort of daisy chains of supply routes, you often wanna have a building like a barracks be the hub because that's what's going to send the army on its way the fastest. If you have something like a runway be the hub, then only every 30 seconds is it going to check, do I have the requisite number of things? If so, send them out, right? The really advanced play is in using the projector because the projector sends uh, these shields along a road. It checks every three seconds and the neat thing is it will proc again, it will, it will uh, release, it will hit the overflow state and send its units uh, once a new shield hits it. So if you have a uh, supply chain of these projectors, right, and all your units are rallying to projectors and the projectors are being sent to other projectors, the units will just stream out. As soon as they hit the projector, they'll go off to their next destination. And so you'll see a lot of players make these big loops around their base uh, where they have all of their units being sent to projectors and then just instantly they leave the projector, go somewhere else. They essentially have no attrition of any of their units as uh, there's no uh, overflow state where they're slowly decaying away. They're always being resent out. These sort of supply chain networks are really vulnerable to disruption, but they look really cool and they can be really devastating in a war where you just have this massive almost like worm of army units uh, that at a given moment you could just send crashing into an opponent's base. I guess the tricky thing about using them offensively is that you're going to hit something in your opponent's base that probably isn't a projector unless they've done you know you a favor and built a lot of projectors for you. 
uh, which means you're going to have to go through this long process of upgrading from a factory to a centrifuge, which takes 30 seconds, into a projector, which takes another 20 seconds, to have another uh, relay point for your army to go. But uh, I, I still think it has a lot of potential, and it looks really cool, which is probably the more important thing, because getting big is not going to be that difficult of a thing. So that's sort of an overview of all the buildings, all the mechanics, what you should be doing with your buildings, uh, and this sort of this hidden mechanic where um, the time that your army spends sitting at a building is determined by how, by whether or not the building is in this sort of overflow state and how frequently it checks to see whether or not it's in an overflow state. Um, so barracks are the quick and dirty easy way and, and mostly what I use as sort of supply hubs when I can um, because they're, if, if an army sits and waits at, at a rally point for six seconds, that's not a big deal. But with projectors, they, you can get it down to where they don't uh, sit at the rally point at all. They just instantly go. And that's the, the absolute best you can get. So you might be asking, okay, well, that is all well and good. And you've explained the mechanics. But then how exactly is it that you've gotten this big? Because no one else is this big. Uh, no one else has been this big for quite a while, uh, and basically you're so big that no one really can even do anything about you. I mean, you're so big that the zombies are nuking you. Well, how, how did you get this way? And this is going to be a really boring answer that's probably going to be pretty unsatisfying for a lot of people, but the answer is just don't fight people. Don't fight other human players. Only fight bots or take empty territory. And the thing is, the bigger it takes so long to load. The thing is, the bigger you get, uh, the easier it is to pursue this strategy. Because number one, people aren't going to want to attack you because you're so big and can crush them pretty easily. Um, but also, your your borders are going to be so large that you're going to have your pick of targets essentially, right? So I can go down here, and you can tell who the bots are because they have sort of bot names: CPU, Clippy, Drone, Mech. Um, I don't think sources. Atlas is right. This is from uh, the Valve series. Uh, the, the Glados is also from Valve. There's another Glados. Baymax, uh, Roomba, Rev9. Uh, let's see if there are any others. I think Tron is. Terminator is. Chappie. Uh, yeah, so they're all going to have names from popular franchises um, about some robot or AI. You can attack them. Also, there's frequently just going to be empty territory. Um, someone's left the game, someone's died, something's happened, and you can just go and seize that territory. And essentially, if you, as long as you don't get stuck in some massive, unending war uh, against somebody, you're going to have easy expansion opportunities and the thing is too whenever you go to war against somebody like just recently there was a guy fighting me called nato uh down here he basically he, he was the, the third largest guy behind uh woody i don't know where woody is and he occupied essentially this entire territory over here how much of that territory did i get when i killed him uh well i wasn't very good about taking it so i got very little but essentially even if I had been good about taking territory, I wouldn't have gotten much because the moment a big player dies like that, a ton of bots and players and new people who are spawning in get put into that empty void, right? The game is constantly looking for empty areas to put new players. Once somebody dies, they're gonna end up in that spot. So the effect of fighting somebody is just to turn them into smaller, weaker players and bots with a little bit of empty territory that you can grab in the moments after their death. Uh, so you're not really even getting that much if you take down a big target. Um, so that's something really important to note. And I guess one other thing, it occurs to me that I really should have explained this at the beginning. You really, 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 really should be using supply routes. Um, so here, for example, I have this airfield auto rallying to uh, this armory over here, which is then itself auto rallying to this frontline area right here. And here we have GLaDOS, a bot, essentially fighting it. I can then take this rally point 
this is going to last because this is near a giant zombie pit that's spawning zombies that kill all my guys. I can then have this rally over here. And so there's going to be this chain where everything that feeds into uh, those, that part of that building chain is going to end up over here. Uh, now, if I had done this chain, yeah, the building died because zombies killed it. Um, but I'll go and I'll recapture the building. In any case, the point is these long chains are what allow you to just sort of auto attack and auto defend areas. And one of the nice parts about them um, is that if I just hit R, R is the hotkey for this, you can kind of see where all of the veins, the arteries of your empire are. And it's pretty easy looking at this to tell who has been attacking you and who, who's been peaceful, right? Some of this is going to be a little bit ragged. It's zombie areas, or clearly there's bots that are attacking me and stuff like that. But if I go and look down, this is how I spotted NATO. Uh, some of these are bad rallies. Like, I probably shouldn't be attacking this guy. Um, but if I go down and I see some guy with just rallies all the way through him, right? I know that guy has been attacking my territory for a while. And so it's really easy to just scan around. Uh, this is a bot nuking me. Uh, it's really easy to just kind of scan around the edges of your empire and see where you're being invaded. And essentially, I do very little organization in this game. When I go to war, I am just clicking and dragging uh, these supply routes. Uh, whoops, let me select the building. I'm clicking and dragging these supply routes. You get a dotted line like this when you have one um, into other production buildings. Ideally, things like barracks. But if not, then a runway. Again, barracks, because those are going to make better supply hubs. And I'm just strewing them about willy-nilly, uh, having them try and cross over as many of these production buildings as possible on each run. Um, and essentially, as you do that, you're creating the defensive, the defensive network for holding that territory. right? Instead of just sending out units and saying, go capture this territory. By sending out a supply route, you're creating sort of the permanent overlapping field of defense um, that, that holds your territory. And this is the reason why most players aren't really going to make any attempt at fighting me, because if they try and fight me, as they push in, they're going to be running into all of these different supply uh, networks, these rallies, from every which direction, right? I don't really care about having them all go the same way. I don't care about having them... Um, not cross each other or anything like that. In fact, if anything, I bias it towards having them cross each other more. That way they kind of cover each other more. I recapture territory easier. The idea is to have essentially every single building in the Empire being visited by units on a regular basis. It's particularly important when you're looking at the zombie areas because if you don't patrol these areas, the zombies will eventually sort of eat their way out. Um, and, and maybe get the stuff that you, you care about. So having stuff crisscross across your zombie-infested areas, uh, these little just sort of dark dots that zombies spawn from, uh, can be really important. But even just, you know, again, on your borders, this is an important step to um, keeping your empire alive while you're AFK, essentially, um, and, and keeping supply networks ready. These are zombies nuking me again. Uh, keeping your supply networks ready in case you're going to go to war. So like this scenario right here, I probably went to war with someone over here at some point. Uh, and now the zombies are just nuking everything, which is fine. That's right. These are the great zombie nukes that are coming in. Um, but I'm constantly reinforcing this. So even though this entire area is just constantly being nuked by angry zombies, because uh, I, I can't really suppress this entire area without killing these people, um, I'm, I'm continuing to reinforce it. No one's tried to claim any of this because they kind of understand that it's mine, right? And if I wanted to go to war against, um, you know, let's say Grandest Moth, what I could do is I could just take some of these points in this network and redirect them upwards, just click and drag. And basically over time what happens is fighting wars against various people uh, in one direction versus another ends up with this massive incredibly ugly crisscrossing web of supply routes um, that form sort of a natural defense for for your your empire um, it looks really ugly it is really ugly um, but in the ugliness comes its strength uh, which is that uh, if everything is going every which way 
then there's no point that someone can attack you at that's going to be easy for them to conquer. Uh, also, hitting R sometimes, not always, but helps you identify buildings that are not connected to your network. Usually, you just identify them by having seeing them sit at full troops uh, and not be rallying stuff out. But um, in any case, so that's the explanation of how uh, I got to be so big. I only fight wars uh, if people go to war with me. Otherwise, I go after bots and uh, empty territory pretty much exclusively. Um, when I do go to war, I use everything. I use artillery, I use nukes, I have massive supply chains reaching out into various places. I, you know, if I need more troops, I'll just direct more troops from whatever supply chain is nearest, some random artery going someplace. Okay, let's draw, draw more and bring a lot more down here, right? Um, and I think a lot of people, if they started using projectiles more, if they understood you could shoot down nukes, uh, if they built defensive structures like headquarters to block the way, um, they'd have a lot more success in wars. And especially for anybody not using supply routes, anybody who isn't auto-rallying your stuff out, it's just no contest. You're not going to ever win a war without using that as a feature. You're not going to really have a stable empire for long uh, without it as a feature. I mean, you can get big just by clicking a bunch, uh, but it, it's exhausting, so please don't do that. Um, and yeah, that's uh, essentially the video. Um, I'd love to promise that there's more content to come, but the truth is I'm probably going to end this empire at some point. I've played this game for a week um, and put in at least a few hours every day of that week, and uh, I'm a little bit tired of it, even though it definitely does. It's, it's surprisingly addicting. It scratches, it scratches an itch, to be sure. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to become any sort of like regular content creator for this. In fact, I, again, I'm just not really set up at the moment to do regular content creation, period. Uh, so that's it. That's all I really had to say. Hopefully this is good advice for the people who have been uh, playing this game and wondering um, what the Empire looks like and how big it is and uh, how I got so big, etc., etc., etc. That's it. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys hopefully at another time.